Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the ARCO Forum of the Kennedy School of Government for the opening plenary session of an extraordinary symposium gathering this weekend that we know as Core Connections, Women, Religion, and Public Policy. My name is Swanee Hunt. I am with the Kennedy School and it has been a delight over the last year and a half to work on planning this gathering with Ann Browdy at the Divinity School here at Harvard. Uh, as you know, Harvard has this very well-known policy of every tub sitting on its own bottom. And for all the strengths of that philosophy, one of the results is there's often a dearth of cooperation among the different schools here. And so this is seen as quite, quite a good thing that we've done here to bring our two schools together. It could not have happened without very generous funding from Diana Rowan, from the Chambers Foundation, and from uh, Helen Hunt. And I am very grateful to all three. And I'm grateful also to Jane Mansbridge, who has played a leading role, yes you have, uh, a leading role in helping make this gathering happen to the staff of the Women in Public Policy program here at the Kennedy School, who I think the average time they went home in the last two weeks was probably about one o'clock in the morning. And also to the Divinity School staff, who've been very, very helpful, and we have many volunteers and students who are participating with us. This is a place where there's an awful lot of analysis done. There's a lot of theory expounded. Sometimes it's helpful to get a, a sense of what we're doing by creating a, a visual image. And the image I'd like to offer to you about what this gathering is about is one that occurred Wednesday night of last week in Dallas, Texas. As my two sisters and I gathered together in the, what my mother called the, her garden room. My mother had died on Saturday and we had come together to, to of course be with her as she died and we were all piled up on the bed and singing show tunes from Oklahoma. She was an Oklahoman. We did not sing Poor Judd is Dead. That's the only one we didn't sing, but we sang all the other ones and we sang her favorite hymns and, and uh, we were absolutely positive that she was hearing us as we sang to her. It was almost like we were singing with her and it was an intensely beautiful time there. And then afterwards, planning the funeral together and figuring out who was doing what and putting together the program. And we just kept talking about mom this and mom that and, and all the memories of mom, 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 all of her great joie de vivre and her openness to life and all the nurturing she'd given us. So on Wednesday night, after the funeral, uh, it was the last night the three sisters would be together until we met here just, you know, eight days later. Amazing, isn't it? And we looked through big brown boxes that had our names on them. A Helen box, a June box, and a Swanee box. And they were boxes of things that Mother had kept from us. And I want you to think about this gathering here as I just tell you a few things that I found in my box. I found a speech I'd given warning about the evils of communism and Castro's Cuba. And it was a speech I gave when I was 12 years old, 1962, in tandem with my father, who was an arch conservative anti-communist leader. Uh, I found the program from the church service where I was awarded star camper at First Baptist Church, uh, summer camp where we sang about, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? I found a picture of me with President Clinton from my swearing in. I found a program from my uh, commencement from getting my doctorate at a very liberal uh, Methodist seminary. 
And I thought about mom, I found something from the Women's Foundation of Colorado and I remembered mom telling me that she thought that the women's movement had done more to damage this country than anything else except for drugs. <laughs> and, and then she said, but everything has some good in it and I'm sure that you and Helen are only part of the good part of it. <laughs> I thought about mom and how violently she had opposed my marriage to a, a Baptist minister, a Southern Baptist minister, because he had voted for Hubert Humphrey. And how, on the other hand, how much she enjoyed my later husband, who was an agnostic Jew, because he loved her, you know? And I thought, what a mix, what a mix. And isn't that what this is about? Isn't this about God who, like our mother, has a big box that's big enough to contain it all, that has a place for all the differences that are represented here in this room, who keeps them all, looks through them, takes them out, rereads them, maybe a little skeptical at times, but still a sense of pride and support. But that's what we're here to launch, an extraordinary conversation among each other about those differences that we share and the commonalities that we find because we share that same great mothering in our lives. Tonight, after we hear from our Marion Wright Edelman, whom I'm going to introduce in a few minutes, those of us participating in this conference will walk over to the Fogg Museum for some in-depth discussions. And you'll find people with yellow signs to help lead the way. And tomorrow, We'll be having panel presentations. We'll be hearing from Kathleen Sands, who's the Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. We'll be hearing from Gloria Steinem, founder of Ms. Magazine, author and activist. So we're really gonna mix it up here. And let's enjoy it, let's have fun. Let's appreciate all the, the things that we share. I have been having a remarkable time getting to know Ann Browdy at the Divinity School. She is a fine scholar who arrived after I had been here just a year, but she thinks that she's the new kid on the block. Do you think that we are in some way, at least psychologically connected, all three of us? I mean, is this extraordinary? <clears throat> It's, I take, we take this to be a sign, all right? And a very, very good sign, a good omen for the goings on this weekend. So Anne, would you come and add to the mix? Thank you, Swanee. I, I hope it's good that we uh, are the scarlet women up here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we certainly have something in common to bring this afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you here on behalf of Harvard Divinity School and the Women's Studies and Religion Program and this very unusual collaboration uh, that, that you're part of today. We've all heard it said that religious outlooks either discourage or prevent women's activism in the public sphere. We've heard it from the religious side where we've seen religious doctrines and teachings offered as justifications for restrictions on women's roles and possibilities. And we've also heard it from the women's side where we've, the women's movement has often treated religion as the problem that needed to be solved as something that had to disappear before women could assume full equality in modern society. But as you know, and as I know, the record of American history tells us something very different. It's clear that the first groups of American women that came together to change society came right out of churches and synagogues where they were united by faith commitments, 
which gave them a basis for critiquing the world they lived in and trying to figure out how to change it and, and giving them the institutional base that they could use to do that. Whether they were Roman Catholic women's orders, building schools for girls where none were available, or ladies' might societies collecting their pennies to put together for their less fortunate sisters, women who met in churches and synagogues introduced the idea of women's public activism and introduced the idea that women could and should join together to change the world they lived in. Now, we also know that women constitute the majority of the laity in virtually every large religious group in this country, and they have throughout American history. So it stands to reason that the people who are motivated by religion to play a role in public life and public discourse will be predominantly women, and that religion will be an important factor in understanding women's public commitments. Now, as a historian, it seems very clear that a certain squeamishness about religion on the part of many public activists then thus obscures women's long-standing leadership and substantial contributions in the policy realm, and that likewise, squeamishness about women's leadership presents a substantial and continuing problem for religious groups. But I think your own presence here today is evidence that the connections we will be examining this weekend have a continuing role in our public life. And let me tell you, if you have not had a chance to read all the bios in your huge briefing book, that you are a fascinating and diverse group of women bringing very varied experiences, varied policy concerns and religious commitments that you don't all agree with each other and we're um, hoping that those disagreements will not be buried under any uh, um, uh, polite exterior but that we will uh, really have a chance to sincerely talk about them this weekend. Um, and to incorporate all of the leadership experiences that you bring into this conversation. So because of all these things, I was absolutely thrilled when Swanee contacted me before my new position at Harvard had actually started. I wasn't yet on the payroll when she called and said, you've got to come to a meeting. Um, but I did, and this collaboration between the Divinity School and the Kennedy School emerged um, to an area that made a lot of sense to me. What I had no idea of at the time was that women, religion, and public policy was not only an area of critical research concern and critical policy concern, but it was also one that was embodied by the Hunt sisters themselves. Somebody else is talking about something else up there. I have no idea what, but can't be as interesting as what I found out when I met the three Hunt sisters. Um, a family that has contributed one sister to each of the areas of our concern this weekend. I just recently had the chance to meet June Hunt, who has committed her life to religious service. And through this conference, I'm not sure where she, Helen, where are you? Oh, <laughs> um, through this conference, I've had the wonderful opportunity of getting to know Helen, who, through her many um, commitments, has devoted her substantial energies to uplifting of women in this society and um, throughout the world. Um, and Swanee is the public policy point in the family, uh, and her contributions to this area on an international level are well known. Um, and I think it's very appropriate that at the conclusion, at conclusion of this conference, for those of you who make it to the end, will receive a rare treat to hear the three sisters sing in harmony, bringing, uh, bringing women, religion, and public policy together in a very concrete way. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I want to thank them for providing this model for us, um, knowing that um, the, uh, not everything will be harmonious this weekend, but we will end on that note. Um, and I want to also take this chance to thank all of you for the voices that you will contribute to our dialogue. Thank you. What a great image. 
Okay, sisters, we've got our work cut out for us. Oh, one day in the early 80s, I was sitting in my office in Denver where I had my foundation work, and the phone rang, and someone answered it and said, it's Marion Wright Edelman, and my heart just started going like this. And so I picked up the phone, and I'm not sure what she said, but I said yes. <laughs> and then I thought, what, what did I say? And of course, it was to help her buy a building, you know. <laughs> and what did I just do? I mean, but how could I say no to Marion Wright Edelman? I mean, Marion Wright Edelman? I, I was quite excited about this. I mean, there is no name that rings with such a clarity in our country as a champion for the poor, as a voice for those who otherwise would be easily ignored. Her children's defense fund has molded consciences, has shaped policies, inspired hope for a generation of Americans. And all over this country, there are small organizations who were birthed because of Marion Wright Edelman's Children's Defense Fund. And they said, we've got to have a local version. That's what we did in Colorado. That happened all over this country. Well, why did we invite her to come here today? As we were talking in our planning group about women and religion and public policy, we started identifying these sort of strands, how women shape religious institutions and make them get involved in policies, or how, how religious institutions have shaped women who then get involved in policies, and how public policies shape religious institutions that impact women, and on and on. And we kept trying to think of, well, who could represent this strand or that strand or et cetera. And there was one woman in this country who was the mix of them all, a woman deeply impacted by her own religious faith who then went out to change the world, but in deciding to change the world, went to the religious community and said, look how your work impacts the women and children in this country. She is an extraordinary human being, a graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School, the first black woman ever admitted to the Mississippi Bar. For two years in the early 70s, she was the director of the Center for Law and Education here at Harvard, the author of five books. Were they harder to, to give birth to than your three sons? I wonder. I, think, I would think so, right? The mother of three sons and a very, very dear friend to many of us, Marion Wright Edelman. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much. Please sit. It is so wonderful to be here with all of you. And I want to just thank Swanee and Anne for coming and bringing us all together around this really important exploration of the cultural and social and political implications of women, religion, and public policy. It's a long overdue conversation which I hope we will continue from this weekend. It's a very complex conversation, and I hope we will deal with it in all of its complexity, and I hope that you will take Swana's invitation. Not to be polite, we must be honest with each other if we're gonna build the movement that we must build across race and class and income and ideology and discipline to build a nation and world that's fit for our children in the 21st century. So I thank you for your leadership, um, and I look forward to what is going to come out of this. And I think it comes at a wonderful time of increasing scholarship. There are a lot of new volumes and scholarship on women and their religious faith traditions, particularly in Christianity and Judaism. And this welcome outpouring of literature has come on the heels of decisions taken too slowly. But beginning in the 1970s, in some of our religious institutions, to grant women standing as clergy or leaders within their own communions. This burgeoning field of study is, I think, the religious correlate of the women's movement. Um, and whatever the source of origin, I think it's wonderful to have this conversation occurring in a document-rich environment, which can, I hope, propel us forward in a more rapid manner. But it is um, a great thing to have us all come together
to see how we can, I believe, and must build the next movement, transforming social movement for our children and families as we face a new century and millennium. I do what I do because of my faith and because of the faith of my parents and community co-parents. Uh, my father was a Baptist minister and my mother um, was the church organist and choir director and chief fundraiser. Every Sunday morning, my parents and sister and three brothers and I gathered around our breakfast table. Each child had to recite a Bible verse. We could get away with Jesus wept only once. <laughs> After breakfast, we had to brush our teeth and comb our hair and dress up in our best clothes and check ourselves out in the mirror and with each other. And off we went to Shiloh Baptist Church um, and Sunday school. After church, with our parents, and then when we got our driver's licenses, we drove elderly or disabled parishioners home and then prepared and ate dinner together and there were always guests that came to Sunday dinner in the preacher's house, and it was terrible. There were only two drumsticks, and often people, we had more than two guests, and they would often pick the wrong piece of the chicken first. Every Sunday afternoon, after we had finished the hospitality of welcoming strangers and friends in our house, we would take flowers from the church to the hospital and visit members of the congregation who were sick and shut in. At Brownie and Girl Scout meetings throughout the year, I also was a Boy Scout because all of them met at the church, and so I went to all the meetings that were in the church. I pledged to do my very best for God and country and for fellow human beings, and every summer, Vacation Bible School, which I loved, one of those weeks was one of my favorites, and we were Baptist, but I even got to go for a second week at the Methodist Church across the street. And we really had such a good time singing about John Brown's body and Michael rowing his boat ashore and asking God to kumbaya. And you know, these were important periods of spiritual formation today with so many changes in our families and with so many children having no place to go in the summer and to do in the summer, I hope we can turn our vacation Bible schools into freedom schools and they can be six to eight weeks and they can be after school because the gun dealers and the gangs and the drug sellers are open 24 hours a day and seven days a week. How often are congregations and community institutions and that is one of the challenges. Are you up there? I see. Does there a door that closes? <laughs> ah, okay. Well, we'll talk louder. This is an important meeting. If you could try, do everything you can to close that door, that would be excellent. Thank you. But we've got to find a way to compete with the drug dealers and the gangs and people of faith and religious congregations have to play a new role in creating new roles for important institutions so that our children can have safe haven, which they too often lack today. Black children, as a result of these kind of daily and weekly rituals of faith with adults who tried to live their faith through action, and that was really the central message of my adulthood from my parents and my community co-parents is that faith was the guiding anchor, but whenever you saw a need, you tried to respond and you translated that faith into action. When there were no playgrounds for black children um, to play in, um, dad and mama started one behind the church. And they put nights in so that we would have a place to play at night and skate and be with each other. When there was no home for the aged, an old Reverend Riddick, who was the first all-time vic victim I now know, lost his memory and his family, um, my parents began one across the street. And that's, we children were drug, but we learned that we had to serve and cook and clean and take care of elderly neighbors, and that everybody was our neighbor. And after my dad died, my mother expanded and carried on that home for the aged. After she died, my brother Julian did. And after he died, his two daughters now carry it on. And it is that legacy of service and advocacy and seeing a need and responding to it that is one that I value. Many of these traditions were carried on when I went to Spelman College. And again, I worry so much that our young people often do not have the forums to hear what we adults feel is important. And I rebelled against compulsory chapel at Spelman College, which I didn't want to go to. 
every morning at 8 o'clock, but you know, in retrospect, I remember far more from the great speakers who came through Spellman, from the rituals of music, from the continuity of rituals from childhood, and I remember about the classes. And when I came to be chairman of the Spellman board, I reinstituted compulsory chapel <laughs> so that they could have a chance to come and hear some of the things. And I just want to acknowledge one of my important mentors who's in the back, Charlie Merrill, who is from, was chair of the board of Morehouse College when I was a young student at Spelman, who gave me such a chance to go around the world. Charlie, stand up, let me thank you. He's just a wonderful mentor. <laughs> it was a wonderful source of mentoring during all of my years as a college student. But those rituals of spiritual formation have broken down in many of our campuses today and in many of our churches and synagogues and mosques. For too many of our children and strengthening our family and youth ministers is one of the things I think that we're gonna to have to do and nurturing a new generation of leaders grounded in faith but seeing faith in action through people of faith acting to deal with the problems in their communities and in their public life is absolutely crucial. So that makes it more important to have you have this dialogue. I always knew about great women of faith. I was glad I had role models in my own family and in my own community. But we were also told stories, and one that stayed with me all of my childhood and my adulthood was about five women 3,000 years ago how Moses' mother and Moses' sister Miriam and Pharaoh's daughter Jochebed came together across race and class and nationality to save the life of one boy Hebrew baby and were God's instruments for creating a leader to transform history. Also remember two other women, Shepra and Pua, who were two slave midwives, Hebrew midwives, who were shrewd but somehow found the courage to not follow the Pharaoh's orders to kill all boy Hebrew babies. These five very unlikely social revolutionaries, a mother, a sister, a Pharaoh's daughter, and two Hebrew slave midwives were God's instruments for transforming history and saving a whole people. Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were my great women forebears, our great women forebears in slavery. As a child, I read books about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and knew there was a fearless former slave woman named Sojourner Truth. They represent the thousands of anonymous women whose voices were muted by slavery, segregation, and confining gender roles throughout history. But Harriet Tubman freed herself from slavery, then went back south through forest and streams and across mountains to bring other people and lead fellow slaves to freedom. She was tough, she was determined, she was fearless, she was shrewd. Harriet Tubman trusted God completely to deliver her and her fellow slaves from their pursuing captives who had placed a bound in her life. She said, Twant me, twas the Lord. I always told him, I trust you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me, and he always did. On my underground railroad, she said, I never ran my train off the track but, and never lost a passenger. I don't know of any train, bus company, or airline who can match this slave woman's record and partnership with God. But Frederick Douglass wrote to Harriet Tubman on August 28, 1868, eloquently summed up her life and that of so many black women of that era of faith. He said, the difference between us is very marked. Most that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public, and I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought in the day, you the night. I have had the applause of the crowd and the satisfaction that comes of being approved by the multitude. While the most you have done has been witnessed by a few trembling, scared, and footsore bondsmen and women whom you had let out of this house of bondage and whose heart felt God bless you has been your only reward. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witness of your devotion.
to freedom. Like Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth was a brilliant, somebody often says, and crazy, but illiterate, wise slave woman, a great orator and powerful presence who also possessed great courage and great faith. She challenged the racial and gender caste system of slavery by suing for the return of a son sold away from her. She got thrown off but kept getting back on the Washington DC trolley cars until they would let her ride. She kept saying, I want to ride, and she kept getting on, and they kept pushing her off. She stood up with fiery eloquence to opponents and threatening crowds who tried to stop her from speaking. And a hostile white man told her that the hall where she was scheduled to speak would be burnt down if she spoke. She replied, then I will speak to the ashes. When taunted while speaking in favor of women's rights by some white men who, at, men who asked if she was really a woman, she bared her breast and as we know famously retorted, ain't I a woman? Detailing the back breaking double burden of slavery's work and childbearing that she had endured. And when she was heckled by a white man in the audience who said he didn't care any more about her anti slavery and, and pro women's talk than an old flea bite, one of my favorite replies was, That's all right, the Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. <laughs> she also never stopped decrying her exclusion from America's life and constitution and used to ask, God, what ails this constitution? I feel some my rights and don't feel any there. She said God replied, Sojourner, there's some little weasels in it. And there are a lot of little weasels that we're still trying to ferret out so that women's voices can be heard effectively in the political process and that is the work of this meeting and what we do afterwards. I met Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune when I was a little girl about seven. And I had never seen a more powerful woman command a room full of men. It was the first time at Benedict College that I heard the phrase, the black of the berry, the sweeter the juice. And hear stories from this powerful woman about how she had challenged segregation and would constantly ask, do you know who I am? I'm Mary McLeod Bethune, and this is a woman who came out and started a college based on fear, on, on faith, um, and five dollars on a dump that she borrowed from someone else. But out of that came Bethune-Cookman College. She founded the National Council of Negro Women. She became Eleanor Roosevelt's friend and was not shy in transmitting messages to President Franklin Roosevelt that the president needs to see me. September Clark more contemporary for some of us. And again, I had such extraordinary mentors and role models growing up, and we need to provide that same kind of mentoring to the young women and men coming behind us. Without her foresight in teaching illiterate citizens to read so that they could vote, on Johns Island, South Carolina, Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference would not have had a training infrastructure to provide the skills for illiterate black citizens to gain the right to vote, a process that transformed Southern politics. She took her citizenship school model to the Highlander Folk School begun by Miles Horton near Knoxville, Tennessee and became its education director. Mrs. Parks attended one of so some of September's training sessions right before the Montgomery bus boycott and she later acknowledged that while she had sat down once September Clark had created an institution and an infrastructure for ongoing citizenship that went on year after year, and we need this multiplicity of roles. You need the symbolic leader. You need the charismatic leader, like the Dr. King. But you know, if Ella Baker hadn't gotten Dr. King to organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and to put an infrastructure, she said, you'll be here responding to events rather than catalyzing events, so that women really were the in the, the infrastructure builders of the civil rights movement and wonderful role models that we can draw from today. The last great woman of faith, and there were so many that keep me getting up every morning, was Mrs. Hamer, uh, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, who many of you knew. Her extraordinary life and courageous witness and words have been shared by many over the years. Reed K. Mills' wonderful book on her life. But there's a new book by a man named Charles Marsh called Long God's Long Summer, Stories of Faith and Civil Rights. And Fannie Lou's profile is in the first chapter 
of that book, it's a, which analyzes her living theology. I respected and loved Mrs. Hamer for her courage after a cruel beating, which many of us have heard of in Winona, Mississippi, um, where she described being beaten with a thick leather thing that was wide, had something in it heavy, don't know what it was, rocks of lead, but everywhere they hit me, I got just as hard and put my hands anyway behind my back and behind my head, and they beat me navy blue, and I was just swollen up like nothing you've ever seen. The blackjack was passed to the second inmate who, would, who was forced to beat her as a fellow prisoner. That's when she said I started screaming and working my feet because I couldn't help it. This enraged her white jailers who just kept beating her on the head and she was left as a result with injured flesh, a kidney permanently damaged, and a blood clot over her left eye that threatened her vision and thrown back in what they then called her death cell in that Winona jail, hurting all over. But she found her voice and she began to sing. Paul and Silas was born, bound in jail, let my people go. Had no money for to go there, bail, let my people go. Paul and Silas began to shout, let my people go. Jail door open and they walked out, let my people go. And I don't know if any of you ever heard Mrs. Hamer's incredibly powerful voice. But 15-year-old June Johnson from Greenwood, Mississippi, and other young SNCC workers, some from Spelman, were in that same jail, beaten and all scared nearly to death in their jail cells, heard Mrs. Hamer singing. And they began to sing too, and they sing away their fear. I love Mrs. Hamer not only because of her profound faith and courage, but because of her wit that used to make us double over in laughter. She used to teach us very serious lessons about tolerance and decency toward the very whites who oppressed her when she sought the vote for blacks and the poor. I loved her hard message of Christianity, which kept us from hating when we wanted to hate. She used to laugh and say, baby, you gotta love them because those white people you know, they're just weak. It wouldn't solve any problem for me to hate whites just because they hate me. There's so much hate, only God has kept the Negro sane. I used to love the way she would scold black preachers whom she considered very timid with her truth because they were afraid to put their faith in action. She says it's all too easy to say, sure, I'm a Christian and to talk a big game, but if you're not putting that claim to the test where the rubber meets the road, then it's high time to stop talking about being a Christian. You can pray until you faint. But if you're not going to get up and do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. She excoriated chicken-eating black preachers who sold out to the white power structure who would not support the movement. She also dealt with us as young people in the freedom schools when young blacks did not want young whites to participate. And she said, if we're going to break down this barrier of segregation, we can't segregate ourselves. She again had a consistent Christianity, and she told us all the truth. And she hit Hubert Humphrey with her truth when he was ordered by President Lyndon Johnson to stop that illiterate woman in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's 1964 challenge to the Jim Crow Mississippi Democratic Party and urged her to accept an unjust compromise of two symbolic delegates from Mississippi at the Democratic Convention. And she genuinely was puzzled. She said to Hubert Humphrey, do you mean to tell me that your position on the ticket is more important to you than 400,000 black people's lives? Mrs. Hamer and her followers were not interested in being politically correct. They were more interested in being morally correct. They had been, she was genuinely disbelieving that any politician could consider his own power more important than the empowerment of hundreds of thousands of others. And because they had not played the political game of public posturing and private deals, she really did not understand initially what went on in Atlantic City. But you know, I often wonder whether the bedrock faith and values and mother wit and courage of Mrs. Hamer and women like her might have prevented many American catastrophic decisions that cost tens of thousands of lives. I like to imagine Mrs. Hamer or Ms. Maybertha Carter or some of the other Dorothy Day sitting down at the table 
with Mr. McNamara and Henry Kissinger doing discussions about the Vietnam War, asking loudly and insistently, is this right? Would God like this? And I think that that kind of voice and those kinds of values that challenge consensus that may be easy and comfortable is really very necessary and one of the things that I hope women will bring to the public policy table as we end the bloodiest century in history. I feel so grateful for these extraordinary role models of faith that we must somehow try to emulate and pass on. What do we do? Three or four things and then I'm done and we'll have a discussion. First is I think we've got to strengthen women's voices significantly in the public policy arena and in the political process. Nowhere in the United States Constitution is there a single sexist phrase. There is no he or his. Every reference is to an office or occupation. It is gender neutral. Yet it was not until Tennessee ratified the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920 that a woman's right to vote was established, but not all women. A black woman in Mississippi in 1963 had no more right to vote and less chance to be heard than Abigail Adams did in 1779 when she wrote that wonderful famous letter to her husband John, who was the second president, reminding him to remember that all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid, Abigail wrote her husband, to the ladies we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. As a result of the efforts of many such outspoken and persistent women, women's participation in the external political and economic affairs of American life has grown, but we are far from being as powerful as either our numbers or our needs require, or of our children's and families' needs require. Looking back over the last quarter century to 75, there were 19 women in 1975 in the House. Today, there are 56, but that's only one in eight. In 1975, there were no women senators. Today, there are nine, that's one in 11. Quarter century ago, there were 604 women state legislators. Today, there are 1,652, about one in four. We have not been using our right to vote that people struggle for many decades to get. That's true of blacks in general and other minority members, but it's true of women. In the last presidential election in 96, more than 45% of eligible women did not vote. We must change that if we're going to realize a different set of national priority. And I hope that that can be one of our concerns. But as we do try to expand the women's voice and power, and I'm proud that we now have a woman Secretary of State and a woman Attorney General and Secretary of Labor and a Secretary of, of um, HHS and Donna Shalala and the head of EPA. We have got to make sure, though, that women don't just carry on and play better the game that men have played over the years. We've got to bring a new set of values that really will transform the nation that we are too often becoming. I loved reading, and Shimani heard me last week talk about Gandhi. I just read a quote from Gandhi about how important women's message and example had been to him as he became more an apostle of nonviolence. And he said, I have repeated times without number that nonviolence is the inherent quality of women. For ages, men had the training in violence. In order to become nonviolent, they have to cultivate the qualities of women. Ever since I have taken to nonviolence, I have become more and more of a woman. I do hope that women will find their voices to speak up against the extraordinary violence that has grown in our society and that we glorify in our society, that we will begin to provide a counter voice to all of that violence that comes across the various screens that our children witness that we will begin to provide a voice against the gun violence that takes the lives of one of our children every two hours, a classroom full. It is time for women of faith to stand up and create a movement as powerful, in fact, more powerful, because Mothers Against Drunk Drivers did not have the NRA on the other side. We have got to create a powerful voice that says we will no longer permit the killing of children to become routine. So I do hope that our new voice in the political process will expand, but that it will bring new messages and new values. And so that should be a part of our concern. 
The second is that we have got to find and exercise more effectively our voice within the religious establishment and to really use our positions as women of faith and use the extraordinary power of religious institutions to tr help transform um, our nation. I was really quite astonished to talk with a great old friend of mine because last year, a very powerful Washington lawyer with whom I share sermons and lots of gossip, and I said to him I was going to send him two sermons by two great women preachers, um, uh, one of whom was Renita Weems, who'd been down at the Haley Farm. And I tell you, my friend of 40 years said to me, Blank and I, who's a prominent black preacher, and I, we don't like women preachers. And I looked at him in total disbelief to say, you, uh, you, and I realized he was serious. In 1998, this backwards view is one that you are expressing um, to me. Um, it was just, but I think that it spontaneously revealed an attitude that too many men still have regarding women and their roles of leadership. We women represent almost two-thirds of the membership of worship and bodies of many of our religious institutions. If black women left the black church, it would collapse tomorrow. We are the infrastructure um, of that church, and that is true in many denominations of mainstream concern. While this percentage may vary with the various faith traditions, the evidence is clear that women are deeply and thoroughly invested in the world of religion, which is expressed through membership, participation, and auxiliary structures of many sorts, including schools, relief activities, and advocacy campaign. Women's leadership roles is in ascendancy in our religious institutions, though not fast enough. Over the last couple of decades, we have seen the number of women clergy, Jewish and Christian, and women in leadership of religious organizations increase markedly. Christian, Jewish, and Muslim organizations at the national level have women in leadership positions, including as chief spokespeople, while men continue to retain most of the important pulpits. The number of women who serve as church-related college presidents, public relations officers for interdenominational organizations, and as chief executive officers, especially of benevolent religious organizations, is increasing. In some religious traditions, women have long dominated the field of religious instructions, instructions, particularly as Christian educators. And what an enormous opportunity if we could bring Sunday school into the 21st century to teach our children how to deal with their contemporary struggles of life in the context of our faith. But what an opportunity for transforming the next generation that we have. Now, in some traditions, like Judaism and Islam, men have been the primary teachers of formalized religious training. But even in these traditions, women have been important conveyors of the religious culture and nurturers of faith formation in relation to children. And women's auxiliaries have a long and distinguished history in community service and advocacy. It's been like a parallel structure where leadership among women have been developed. And we need to use that power far more effectively. I love, I'm a Baptist, but I love the United Methodist women who didn't give their money to the men in the 60s and who have an independence and they collected hundreds of thousands of signatures. We would not have a child care bill today had the Methodist women not gotten out there along with many other women of faith and really gotten the, got those letters, got those voices, lobbied to exert and make sure that our children and our parents got effective child care. All of this advocacy needs to be utilized. We need to see the advantages of our training, of our leadership opportunities within the religious structures where we are the majority, and I hope that we will see that grow. Finally, I think that we've got to go beyond just service and advocacy. I think we've got to ratchet up the women's voice. I think we've got to have an, an, a new transforming movement that puts the social economic underpinnings beneath our children. We like to say we need a movement to make sure that no child is left behind. There are breathtaking examples of the ways in which women have organized, often through their religious institutions for the common good, and in, which have in turn affected the conduct of nations. I look back at the black sash in South Africa and how women came together 
to begin to challenge apartheid. I had been very depressed when I went to South Africa talking to the political leaders. And only two things began to move me to see that major change was on the way. That was going out to Stellenbosch and talking to the theologians and hearing them begin to redefine apartheid as unacceptable in the context of Dutch Reformed theology. And I realized that the roots of South Africa were changing beneath the political process that seemed hopeless. And I saw women, black women and white women and Africana women and British women and, and African women coming together to say, we're gonna build a new, more peaceful and tolerant society. We can do that here in America. We saw the Latin American women who did the public rituals for the disappeared, but their public witness and mobilizations helped propel major human rights changes in Latin America, and we need that same kind of force. We saw women in Ireland, Merritt Corgan and Betty Williams that I know that Swanee has worked with, begin to try to find ways of bridging the religious chasms that resulted in the deaths of so many children and others. And I think in our own history, whether it's the Jane Addamses or the Dorothy Days, um, others have come, has been women have played a major voice in movement building. And while we have often done that behind the scenes, it is now time to do that out front, working together, putting aside our differences and finding that very big common ground of concern for rebuilding our families and our communities, stopping the violence and seeing that all of our children get a chance to succeed. I think Sojourner Truth gave us our charge. She said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. I hope we will get our nation's values, get our mother's primacy over, mis over, over missiles, get our baby's primacy over bombs, get our self to become a nation that really does not any longer allow our children to go hunger, hungry, that allows our children to be safe. That can happen, but it will happen because women like you will come together and put aside our differences and find a cause and a purpose bigger than ourselves and determine that we're gonna be ancestors and pass on a nation that's more loving and tolerant than the one that we inherited. Thank you for your work. Marion uh, mentioned that we were together last Sunday night, I think it was, uh, in a very, very different kind of, of situation in San Francisco, the State of the World Forum, where they parade world leaders out on a stage. and uh, I, They want to get as many world leaders together as they can, but to uh, get a world leader to come, you've got to offer them the microphone, of course. So they'll, they'll tell everybody, you know, come and speak here, and then once people come, they say, now you'll have six minutes. And so Mary and I were, were laughing about you know, what it's like to be, to be told as you get up on the stage, well, you'll have six minutes. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. In Cambridge next week, you're going to have an hour and a half. She said, an hour and a half. <laughs> what am I gonna do with an hour and a half? And I said, we'll see. So now we'll see, because you will help direct this last portion of our time. There are two microphones on this floor and two microphones above, and we will rotate uh, among your questions. Re remember that we're asking you for questions here. Questions have question marks at the end of them, right? So please, uh, Marion, would you like to come up? And I will, I'm sure you're quite, capable of managing the situation yourself. Well. All right. I'll, I'll let you know when we get near the time. Okay. Are there questions? I see such great wise folk here sitting in the front row. Yes. You there find there Hannah? There, and I can't see, can, ah, do you see that one up there? Right up, she's waving. Okay, I see okay. you, and thank you very one, much. Is there one over? I see three, is there a fourth mic up high? Yeah. There's one up oh, on the other side of that big, but there's no one standing there. Okay, but I, I'll start up top and then I'll come down here so that I can see you. Yes, ma'am. 
Yes, my name is Faith Green. I'm a student at Harvard Divinity School preparing for ordination in the United Methodist Church. And what I was wondering is what do you see as one of the most dire needs that women in the ministry can meet? You mentioned the difference between public roles and advocacy roles and many other roles. What do you think is one of the most important needs women in the ministry specifically can address? Well, let me say something about women in the ministry as as, as symbolic of what adults have got to do. We don't have a child and youth problem in America. We have an adult problem in America, and children need people of faith with integrity and who live what they preach. And so I do struggle to live what they preach because none of us are perfect. But you know, I would have been devastated had my parents not been who I thought them to be. And so many children today are so devastated because the leaders that they look to for leadership are saying one thing and doing another. And so I hope that women ministers or women in the ministry can bring new integrity to the ministry so that our children will be able to trust and have faith in the faith of those who are leading them. Then secondly, I really do hope you will put that faith in action. And if I had to choose one thing other than the integrity of your ministry is to, for goodness sake, let that church be a sanctuary for children and for families. Mm -hmm. People need, we're so isolated. Young people with the change in family forms, if parents are not home after school and parents have to work, and it was now the public policy of our nation that all poor women must go out to work, what's going to happen to those kids between three and eight? What's going to happen on the weekends? What's going to happen in the summer? And we really need to make sure that the church becomes, or the synagogue, or the mosque, or the place of faith becomes a, a gathering place for the young and for families, a safe haven where they can see people engaged in purposeful work, reaching out and caring for them. So I hope you will really have a ministry of service and advocacy to the young and families. You know, when individual fathers are now picking up their kids on Saturday mornings um, in divorced families or in non unmarried families, many of them often just take those kids on off to McDonald's. It would, wouldn't it be nice if you could sort of have a place for them to come in the context of your congregation and begin to understand about parenting skills and begin to see that there's a new community of caring. And so I think there's such opportunities for the, for the, for, for the religious community now to react in new ways to the changing families and to the extraordinary breakdown in community. So I hope you will build community and be a sanctuary. Thank you. Yes, sir. One issue that uh, women are starting to speak out more on that's starting to get some attention is male circumcision. Uh, we've been hearing from uh, nurses who are organizing, uh, not wanting to participate. Uh, mothers are organizing uh, against it. Jewish women are speaking out. I'm wondering what your feelings are about this issue. I don't really have any feelings out about it. I have not taken a position. I know about female circumcision issues in Africa, but I don't have a position on that one way or the other. My children were circumcised. I do want to ask, though, I, I should have said earlier, could you let us know before you ask your question who you are and where you're from? I don't. Yes. My name is Vicki Coitz. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm one of your many, many uh, previous summer interns at the oh, Children's wonderful. Defense Fund. Thank you. So it's fabulous to see you again. Nice to see you. Um, my question is about um, involving those who have been in poverty in some of the policy making and some of the community building to combat poverty. And as a woman who is from a non privileged economic background, what are some of your thoughts on this? And what are some of the initiatives that you envision in order to involve people who have been there uh, at local levels and all the way up to the Kennedy School of Government and other schools of public policy who will be cre creating policies to address poverty? Well, I think we should find opportunities for young and all of us, including those in the communities that we, in quotes, want to help. Um, all of us should be at the decision-making table, and that's a part of the bridge building that I hope that this kind of conference um, is going to encourage, and I hope that some of the inspiration from the women that I have described, because some of the wisest lessons that I have ever learned didn't come out of Harvard or Yale-educated mouths. They came out of the mouths of, of the women in my community um, who didn't have a lot of formal education, but who understood instinctively what Walker Percy wrote when he said, you can get all A's and still flunk life. And so I hope that we can find ways of being inclusive, but secondly, it can't be artificial participation. 
we need to find natural ways um, of, of respecting and opening up our community institutions um, to all of those in the community. We have something called, as you know, the Child Watch Visitation Program to take people out to see and feel, and not only the, the, the suffering of children and families in their communities, and to get it that violence in that community cannot be contained and that we have a self-interest in sort of responding as a citizen and as just an ordinary person of faith. Um, I remember the story recently of a father in Harlem who tried to do everything right for his child, a white father in fact, um, who was working at one of the hospitals, but who was just concerned after trying to do everything about the quality of life in New York City and decided that he was gonna move out to the suburbs and as fate would have it, that child ended up getting killed in a crossfire. And people were trying to tell him he did everything he could, that he was um, you know, really a good father, had spent time, but he said, no, I didn't do everything I could because I did not pay enough attention to other people's children. I think that we've got to find models of common involvement. The Freedom School model for us and the way in which we're using the former Alex Haley Farm, which is our Center for Spiritual Renewal and Leadership Training, brings together young people of every race, of every income level, in a struggle to see how we provide reading-based summer schools for younger children who don't need Michael Jordan as a role model. They need somebody who grew up three blocks away from them in the inner city or in their rural area, went off to college, and is coming back to give them a chance and to see, show them what they can be. So it's not artificial mixings of races and incomes. It's really being able to provide and places to engage in common struggles. So we've been able to get black and Jewish and Asian and Latino young people from every class serving together and learning together about the strengths of those that they're trying to help. And we should not see young people who are poor as objects of service. They also have an awful lot to contribute. And one of the other things that I think it is important is for us to celebrate children and young people as we do now in a dozen cities who are beating the odds. The majority of kids are not killing anybody, are not on drugs. They are doing incredible, making incredible efforts to stay in school, take care of younger siblings, hold their families together, and very moving. And we need to celebrate the success and the strength. And so I think it's opportunities for common struggle and congregations ought to be a natural gathering place. Um, and people of faith ought to be a natural gathering place. In all of our freedom schools, we make sure that children go out and serve the elderly or go to homeless shelters, um, and that's well of our college students. And we, they've got to learn from the beginning that they can make a difference. But I think it's opportunities like that to do meaningful, purposeful things together. Thank yes. you very much. You're welcome. Yes, would you like to take someone from that side? I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry. Hi, Letty Cotton Post. Hey, ben. Lottie, hey, how, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. No, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Earlier you spoke, after you talked a little about Fannie Lou Hamer, you said during the Vietnam War, it would have been nice to have people like Fannie Lou at the table asking, is this right? Would God like this? Those of us whose activism is fueled by faith uh, sometimes get concerned when God is cited because God has been coercive on the right. How do you address this and how do you integrate God into your activism and language uh, without running into the problem of who knows God's will better? Well, I don't think that um, I don't have a narrow a doctrinal view and certainly don't think I have a corner on God or that any of us does. I think on the other hand, those of us who um, are concerned about certain issues should not be so hesitant about using it in a non-judgmental way, in a non-exclusive way to say our faith, you know, leads us to take certain positions and to ask certain questions and to provide certain sacrificial witnesses. I also don't think we need to cite God in order to also have a strong moral vision. So it's about, and you know, it's not being ashamed of one's faith, but also not being dictatorial or narrow or judgmental in one's faith. And so it would be nice to have more voices raising moral questions of right and wrong from a range of, of points of view. So, Without guess, necessarily using God. Without abusing or using God, and mm -hmm. perhaps, but I think Mrs. Hamer would have, and so speaking in her <laughs> voice, um, I was asserting that, but I think that having a lot of us raising questions about is this morally the thing that we ought to be doing, is this fair, is this right within the context, having all of us, again, 
in the context of the kinds of three hundreds of billions of dollars of post-Cold War defense expenditures. I really hope we can begin to say, is this right? Um, is this what we ought to be doing at a time when we're in this boomingly prosperous economy? I would hope that somebody would raise whether it is morally right for the rich to keep getting rich and the poor to stay poor and for children to be the poorest groups of citizens. And I don't have any hesitations in saying that that is not just, that is not righteous, that would not withstand the test of the prophets or of my faith or of most faiths that requires to protect the weak and the young. And so again, but that does not sort of say I'm the only voice, but I think we should not be hesitant um, and, um, or sanctimonious. Thank or, you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I'm Loretta Williams, uh, the Myers Center for the Study of Human Rights and Bigotry. And I want to thank you for your witness over so many, many years and ask you to tap back into Head Start. And I'm thinking about the discussion right now, you're asking us to think about ways to frame the discussion. Public schools, testing, head start in the uh, campaigning right now. There is one proposal that head start children will be tested and if after three years the particular head start site is not showing tremendous grade improvement of these pre-kindergarten children, uh, then Head Start should be dismantled. I'm wondering if you could help us think of ways to frame that conversation. What are you thinking about right now in terms of Head Starts and public schools? Well, I think that public schools are the crucible of our democracy, and that's where 90% of the children in America go, and that we have got to see that every child has a fair chance to get what they need to succeed. It is a shame that in this rich nation, there's not a single large school system with any degree of diversity by income and race has ever educated all of its children to achieve at high levels. And so I think we've got to provide a very strong voice for public education and for getting every child ready for school with the range of supports they need, including high quality accountable Head Start and child care. The Head Start people need to talk to the child care people who need to talk to the preschool people, and it all needs to be child focused. It will be a shame if we go through another period of education reform that is not based on children, and we should not demand from children what we adults have not yet demanded of ourselves. And so we need to put into place high expectations for all children in all kinds of schools, well-trained teachers, um, that know their subject matter and that give children the supports that they need if you're going to end social promotion. And I am for standards because children need to learn and the children who have the least need the most in terms of both the expectations and the supports to reach those expectations. But we've got to talk about making sure that the adults are accountable for producing in those children what we then test them on. And quality must be there um, in Head Start, in public schools as well. And so I think that, you know, when the governor, when, when President Bush and the 50 governors came together, they had, they laid out eight education goals, um, which were really wonderful education goals, which were achievable, important. Not a single one of them is going to be achieved, including the cornerstone goal of getting every child ready for school. I think that, again, a part of our movement for children so that they will not be left behind is that we will have to provide a strong voice in the public policy arena for early childhood investment. It is not right that in those early years, including in many of our Head Start centers, some of them are very good, some of them are not so good, and some of them are okay, um, that, you know, a child care worker is making an average of $13,000 a year without benefits. You know, that's just, you know, we say early childhood development, then we sort of, you know, don't pay or value the people who take care of them. I don't think that our public school teachers who make 34000 on average a year are worth many times less than a tobacco executive in a corporation that produces a product that tears us apart. And so I think we really do have a major priorities debate that we're going to have to drive, but it's going to be up to us as women of faith and others to really say children have to be at the center of this debate. And all of us then have to hold ourselves accountable for making sure that they get what they need to be ready for schools and that we really have schools that are ready to serve all children. And I really hope that more and more young people will go into teaching 
um, and see this as a mission. I think it's as important as I viewed lawyering in the 60s. I'm so proud to have at least one public school teacher in my family and new generation. But I think that we've got to make, the, we've, we've, we've got to have this debate and support the public schools. I'm deeply concerned about the voucher issue and about many churches, black churches particularly, making alliances with other conservatives around vouchers to undermine the public schools. I want public school choice. And I think that we I support for charter schools. I think that the public schools have to be held more accountable. And you know, I think some kind of competition is good. But I think that we've got to focus on the fact that it's really quite unbelievable that in this, we're the remaining superpower in the world. And we can't figure out how to get our children ready for school or how to educate all of our children in schools. But I think we have to take a very strong stance um, in favor of greater investments. I'm opposed to Head Start being narrowed down into an education program. I'm opposed to it being put into a Department of Education. We fought that battle when President Carter came in and won because the comprehensive services that is required is important. But Head Start also has to change and reach out so that we can begin to perform, we can begin to meld together the preschool funding streams with the higher quality childcare streams with Head Start so that parents will have what they need both to work and that children can have the quality of care they need to get ready for school. So it's a complex set of issues, but I hope we'll speak up on them and study them and be informed and let our voices be heard. But public education should not be weakened. It should be strengthened. But that means teacher accountability and it also means citizen voice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, my name is Allison Richardson, and I'm not part of this wonderful conference, but I'm a student at the Kennedy School. And I want to first start by thanking you and saying that I'm so glad that you're here. In the Thank midst you. of econ and statistics, I often forget why I came here. And you've served as a reminder for me tonight that I have children at heart. Um, a couple of my questions have sort of been answered, but I'll ask them in different ways and deepen them. One is, I know that there are a myriad of issues. I'm a, I was a public school teacher prior to coming here. And so I know f deeply that there are a myriad of issues affecting children. Um, but if you could choose one, I can't work on a myriad of issues at once, which would you suggest is the most urgent issue affecting children? That's part of it. And the other part of it is, as an educator, I've seen tons of plans being put forth as to what we should do about education, so on and so forth, but have not seen any change. And so my question is, why do you think the state of education and the lives of children haven't been bettered? Is it that we just don't care enough about education or enough we at large, or enough about our children to really improve and put an honest effort forth? I think that children are not valued in this society. Mm. I think we talk about putting children first, but we don't. Um, we don't, you know, no other industrialized nation lets its children be the poorest group of Americans. No other industrialized nation lets its children not have health care. I mean, if every 66-year-old has health care, which I favor, why shouldn't every six-year-old and 16-year-old have it? If we have Social Security in our older years, why should we stand by and let the safety net for poor mothers and children be eroded? The fact is, we don't really value our children and people who care for our children. We Parenting is the most important role in the society, and yet we do the least preparation, provide the least supports. We don't provide a real choice for parents, mothers, and fathers to stay at home, unlike many other industrialized countries, or to go out into the labor market without worrying about the safety of their children. Bottom line is that children don't vote, they don't make campaign contributions, they don't lobby, and they have not had as an effective voice, which again is the plea for why we have to come together to do something, and secondly, like everything else that's fragmented in our society. You know, the Head Start people don't talk to the child care people, they don't talk to the child health people, they don't talk to the juvenile justice or runaway people. It was only when the Reagan administration came in and began to cut all the fingers of the hand that they began to realize that they belong to the same hands. But we've got to build a movement that is child-focused and not just about teachers and their salaries or Head Start jobs. It's got to be about children. And so how do we? you know, really say to our kids that you are going to be the center, which is very radical, of education reform because everybody else's interest um, gets put in the way. And so we adults are going to have to figure out, 
you know, what we really truly value in our families and how we spend our time with our own kids and our schooling and the kind of decisions that we make about professions. But the bottom line is this is a nation um, that has not put its actions and its leadership behind its young, and I am convinced that it will be the moral Achilles heel that will topple us unless we come together to say this has got to change. So we've got to build a movement and a constituency um, for children in the context of education reform, because if we don't, everybody else will be reformed and children will still not be learning. So that um, it's children, how do we put them first? And I think if you want, in terms of your issue, I guess the one that I'm, I'm obsessed with is, is a twofold one. I mean, it's, it's violence. We've got, to, we've got to deal with the craziness of guns in this society. There are 200 million guns in circulation. We import and, and, and produce another one every eight seconds. Um, nobody's safe. Um, but the majority of those gun deaths are suicides, which I think, re again, raise, and then 92% of those suicides are white. We've got to, I don't know why everybody was so surprised about Littleton and Conyers. Since Dr. King and Robert Kennedy died in 1968, we have lost 1.4 million Americans to violence. About 950,000 of those have been gun violence. A little over half of them were suicides, and 92% of those were suicides. And what does that say about the lack of purpose and ability to function or find enough grounding in one's family and in one's faith and in one's civic life um, and in one's community? that so many resort to this, and guns have just lethalized that, and about half have been homicides. But we have got to confront this plague of violence, which Dr. King and, uh, and Robert Kennedy warned us against. And the fact that children are killed every two hours by guns and we're standing for it, we lose more young black men every year to gun violence than we lost in all the lynchings in American history. But where is our anti-lynching or anti-violence campaign? So. We, just, we have a lot of soul searching to do, and where is the voice of faith on these issues of life and death for our children? Yes? Hi. I'm Reverend Margaret Powell, pastor of Redeeming Sorry. Time Baptist Church in New York you? City, and a graduate and former interim pastor of Union Theological Seminary. My question comes straight out of the mouth of Sojourner Truth with one word of my own. Ain't I a woman pastor? I asked that question because my name tag became a metaphor of what we do with each other as women. We neglect one another and we don't talk about our own uh, programmed sexism and uh, programmed prejudices against one another. Now I'm here as guest and friend of Helen Hunt, so I know that this was not intentional, but I've been to many conferences where I'm never acknowledged as a pastor, let alone a reverend. And I usually walk away and say, eh, what's the big deal? But I was walking up to Harvard uh, Square Park there, and it just started to bother me today. I said, this is a woman's conference. If I don't get up from the back of the bus today and walk to the front, I never will. So I'm asking this question, ain't I a woman pastor? Can you believe that I am, that I've been trained, that I'm endowed by the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel, to teach children, to help the age, <coughs> and so on and so forth? Ain't I, I like that word ain't, because it takes it right to the root. Ain't I a woman pastor? That's my question to you. I think I'm you so glad to meet with question. you and look you face to face <laughs> and ask that question. I think Thank you, you have answered your own question rather emphatically. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have been neglecting upstairs. Is there a question upstairs? To the right. To the right. I can't even see. Yes, no. sorry about that. I can't see you. Hi, um, I'm Lucy White, and I teach at the law school. And I want to, first of all, echo what everyone else has said, how just wonderful it is that you're here giving us this message. My question um, is as follows. I've been working for a number of years now at the grassroots level with low-income women um, in, in different roles. And what I've heard over and over again, and I'm, I'm sure this is not news to anyone else who's, who's done this work, are feelings of very deep hurt and rage and, and a sense of injustice, particularly among African American women that goes way, way, way back. And that gets in the way sometimes of people being able to live healthy lives. And as I've thought about it over the years, I, I'm coming more and more around to a sense that in addition to everything else you are promoting, 
that a serious cross-racial movement for reparations needs to um, be looked at and, and, and thought about in this country. And I just wondered what your feelings about that are. Well, I don't know that that will move us ahead. I think that what we need is a serious, serious movement of common struggle around the common concerns that we face today, which is why I think if we can start from the here and now recognizing and acknowledging our history of injustice. But the issue is not reparation from the past. The issue is how we repair the past by making sure that our children today get what they need so that we don't continue to repeat the injustices of the past, which is why the Children's Defense Fund came into being, to see if we could prevent welfare, to see if we could prevent dependency, to see if we could find a way of building bridges across race and class around our children and building a future. So I guess I'm more concerned about how we get black, white, rich, poor women of every faith together looking at the terrible cries of all of our children, because I think that the children in Littleton were crying out as loudly as the children in the inner cities. All drug abuse is everywhere. Teenage pregnancy is everywhere. Um, you know, disconnection and alienation is everywhere. Intolerance is everywhere. How do we find a way to come together to say to our children, we love you enough that we're going to struggle and make sure that our country becomes safe for you. We're going to say with, you know, that we're not going to have the levels of poverty that we have, and we're going to really provide a voice for those women who have been battered and abused and who can't often speak for themselves. And so I hope that we can acknowledge openly all of our differences in the ways in which white women and black women and others across class have not been able to communicate and find common cause and hope that we can have emerged in the 21st century a new kind of women's movement that is one that talks about family and community and that is focused on children which finds our common ground and that around again important struggles of redirecting national priorities so that the rich don't keep getting rich and poor people who are working every day and can't still make ends meet so that health care can become a reality. That rage will subside with real remedies. What we have not had is a real movement to address the social and economic needs of so many of those who have been denied them in the past. The real civil rights issue is how do you educate children, all of them, so that some are not programmed for Princeton and others for prison. And so I think that we have got to gain address the things before us and give hope and give a sense of common struggle. The reason I never lost despair or many children never lost despair when we were growing up because segregation wasn't wonderful is that we always had adults who were in the struggle with us and who kept saying to us that we will help work to change the world. And children were real co-partners in that. It was children who withstood the bombs in Birmingham and the fire dogs in Birmingham. And children are not citizens in waiting. And so I hope that around our young and with new voices, we can empower them to understand that they can make a difference. But I would not go back to repay the past. I would go back now and build something to build the future. Is there someone else up there that I have been missing? Over on the left. Swanee, I can't see. OK, Hi. left, thank you. Hi, Hi. Mrs. Edelman. Hi. My, my name is Jordan Moranis. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also one of the founders of an early childhood education organization called Jumpstart. Terrific. I know um, I hear everything that you're saying about building this constituency, and you, more than anybody, have been the inspiring voice for this constituency over the last generation. There are so many trends going in the opposite direction. I, I guess my question is, is just very direct. What sustains you? What makes you optimistic other than your faith? There are so many indicators that people are tuning out to a lot of these issues, that people aren't voting, that people aren't serving as good role models. There are pockets of wonderful things happening everywhere, and so many of them are led by you. But you certainly should have reason to be pessimistic at times. Other than your faith, what other indicators or what other things make you so optimistic? Oh, I get pessimistic about two hours out of every 12 during the day. Um, but then you get up. Nothing said you're going to win on everything, but it doesn't say you have a right to quit. And it is my faith, first of all. Secondly, um, I've seen enough victories. Um, you know, the fact is, I mean, you know, for all the things that I think we've got to do in ratcheting this movement up to a whole different level, um, you know, there are millions of kids who 
Head Start, and handicapped children are going to school all over America. That wasn't so 25 years ago, and we take it for granted. There, those are children who have child care. We got five million children the right to health insurance. I want all 11 million to have it, and then I want their parents. But that's progress. And I go out everywhere in communities, and while you certainly see the negative signals, I don't know at the same time I've ever seen so many good people trying to do things in their own community because we're beginning to recognize that something fundamental has come loose in the society and it's gonna be up to us to put it back together. Dr. King is not coming back. We do not have Abraham Heschel. We do not have Reinhold Niebuhr. We have to be that moral voice and those political voices. And so I get hope from the good things that I see people struggling to do and lastly, you know, you, you cannot, how can you be indifferent? How can you stop trying? in the face of so much need, so many children who have so much hope and need adults so much. Um, and I am encouraged by the new generation of young leaders like yourself. We're trying to put it together, but you know, we need to kind of just keep at it. Movements don't start over five years or 10 years or 20 years. The Civil Rights Movement did not start in the 60s. It started in the 40s, or really after World War I, with people who started coming home for the war, fighting for a democracy that they couldn't face at home. It took a strategy from Charlie Houston, Thurgood Marshall, to, to attack on the legal front, and to begin to try to do that incredible challenge to apartheid. It took many individual actions that a whole lot of people sat down before Ms. Park sat down, um, and it didn't go anywhere, but it takes a lot of seeds and watering and fertilizer. I have faith that because what we're doing is right, um, because our faith requires us to speak up for children, um, that somehow, you know, and because I see enough people beginning to, from their own concerns, express that concern, somehow it keeps, it's, it's, it's enough to keep going. I've been reading scriptures, for, all of us read scriptures, and you see new things every time you did it, but I must say I was struck by the one with the, four friends who took the paralytic before Jesus and every time that, you know, I looked, somehow I saw a different thing in it about, you know, some weeks ago. Um, every time we go take children to see the master, they get, the crowds push us back. They can't get past the first front door. But they did not stop because the crowds were in the way and they couldn't get in. They decided somehow that they were gonna climb up on the roof and they knocked off a few shingles and they, got some opening in the roof and they lowered their paralyzed friend down before the master who yes. healed him saying your faith to the four friends mm -hmm. and trying to get your friend before me um, resulted in that healing. I think that we need to be, we have lots of meetings and we have tried, we've done 25 years of reports and we lobbied and we do all the technical things and we'll continue to do it and we'll do the litigation and we'll do the lobbying and we'll do the model laws but it's time now to move up onto the roof and to be less polite and to really say that in faith, as people of faith, we are going to make sure that our children's needs are heard by those in power and we have got to go and get some of that power by running for office and being people who reflect different values in power. So you get discouraged but you get up. And if you read about Ms. Hamer and Ms. Ms. May Bertha Carter, you know who's got any right to quit. And so I've had wonderful examples of people who just kept going no matter what, and I want to be half as good as they are. Mm -hmm. I'm Fawzia Ahmed. I'm a resident scholar at the Brandeis Women's Studies Scholars Program. Um, my research involves work with uh, not so hesitant, illiterate women from Bangladesh. They um, wanted equal right, equal pay for equal work. They wanted schools for their kids. And then they wanted and have started a movement which includes their husbands. Because they realized it wasn't the individual landlord who was oppressing them, it was the system. When they started doing this analysis and demanding these things, they were <laughs> outlawed by the mosque. They came to me and they said, the God that's described by the mosque is a long list of don'ts. Don't go out and work. Don't do this. Don't run for public office. Stay in your place, the status quo. They left because they said there are many more of us than there are of you. 
And they said, we need spirituality in our lives. We need a loving God. Today, the United States leads the industrialized world in income inequality. What role is there for this kind of systemic analysis, class analysis, systemic analysis, in the church in the United States today? I think that it is a crucial institution for having this kind of systemic analysis and debate, and it's precisely what has to happen as we try to determine who are we in this new century? What kind of people are we? What is our moral vision? Um, are we going to continue to see this gap between rich and poor go on? Are we really going to see the violence go on? Is this what we want America to be? Are we the kind of people that fosters these values? And that is the kind of conversation that ought to be going on in every congregation of faith in America. And then not just the conversation. How do we study it and pray over it? And then how do we act to change it? But those are precisely the broad moral issues that the people of faith in our institutions ought to be um, debating, and I hope that some of that will come out of this conference. And I also love the fact that we, all of us have got to get out of our boxes. Nobody should ever stay in those boxes. And we need, as women, to look and, and affirm ourselves in the context of our faith um, and not be defined by others, but this is precisely the kind of moral debate that has to occur. Yes, one last, yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your patience. Barbara Hilt, Women's Action for New Direction, oh, yes. WAND, and a former Massachusetts State legislator. And I'd just like to thank you. I hope that you've inspired everyone as you continue to inspire me to be an advocate for children. And I, I pray that people of faith, women of faith particularly, will be speaking up, um, particularly on the issue of peace and violence prevention. And I got into politics because I saw men uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle continuing to define national security in terms of uh, war and a major uh, arms buildup, which continues today at the expense of women and children in this country and all over the world. And I just wonder what you think will inspire more women to get active on this issue, because in, until we start <laughs> reducing our, our arms build up and our preparation for war, these human needs you speak about will never be met. Well, that's, again, that we need a fundamental transformation of American priorities. Where, I mean, again, I just ask you, where are your congregations? Here we are under the Clinton defense plan. We will be spending by 2004 $322 billion a year um, um, on weapons of death and on the military um, at a time when our children can't walk to school safely and are not safe in their own neighborhoods. How do we get discussions about these going? I was just out, outraged. In fact, the Congress will try to do more, far more um, on the military. The C10 and a half billion dollars put back in the defense budget by the Clinton White House and the Congress will do more. Um, for the Star Wars missile defense system, which you've already spent tens of billions of dollars showing it doesn't work when we again can't get our children enough food to eat and you know every fifth person in a food line is a child. How do we get these issues of fundamental national priorities in debate in our congregations of rich and poor, of war and peace, of the fundamental values that we want to reflect as a nation. I mean, what does it matter for us to be number one in military expenditures, military exports, um, and we can't keep our kids safe at home? What does it mean to have the number one role in, in, in the number of millionaires and billionaires? We are number one, number one GNP, and yet we have our children as the poorest group of Americans. What does it mean to both to be number one in health technology and we have 18th standing in our infant mortality rates? Who are we? And what do we stand for and how can we, and I hope that you will come out of this meeting with some kind of, how do we get these discussions going? How do we get effective gun control? How do we do our homework in prayer circles and study circles so that we can answer all the myths about the Second Amendment, um, so that we can be prepared to, to understand what strategies we want to sort of begin to get guns out of the hands of kids and of those who kill them. So I hope that those are central concerns. Tell me how we can get you to stand up with us to say enough 
and to begin to provide a voice that is loud and more effective in the political process for our kids. And that's one of, I mean, that's the question that I'm constantly, constantly asking. What is it going to take for you to stand up and say we want to move in a new direction for kids? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. This is the last one, Swanee tells me. Okay, thank you, gentle, strong woman. You've inspired me so much. My name is Jan Bryant Hellroyd, and I flew in this morning, so I'm a little bit hoarse with no sleep over the last two days, after meetings with some secretaries in Washington, D.C., who are African-American people. And I was offered what could be an opportunity and what may not be an opportunity without some serious thought on it, to chair a movement to build a better town out of the hometowns that I had as a child, which are Tarboro and Princeville, North Carolina. Now, most people know God's been crying a lot on these towns lately, and the tears have washed a lot of homes away. Well, as you talk, you <coughs> provoked me to think I was just about to say no to this mission I was asked to, uh, to accomplish. And then you provoked me. You talked about it being about the children, and you talked about your Sundays and your dinners. You talked about my own life. And you guilted me into a different sense of responsibility. I'm a business person. And I've liked to excuse a lot of what I've done and not done as I give a lot of money to the community and get out there and work, so I'm OK. And then I sat here, and a hero of mine provoked me to guilt. Before I make a, an emotional decision to take on this challenge, I'd like to ask you, what would be the core dynamics that would, that would ensure that any, any chairmanship of a movement to, we can't change our history, but you said we can rebuild for a better future. You said that. I said that, and I believe that, and I know that. What would be the key, the core dynamics, that if I sign my name to move forward with an initiative, to rebuild these towns. I don't want to rebuild them. They, my hometown was one of the most prosperous plantations in this nation. And less than two weeks ago, it still was a plantation, just not prosperous. What dynamics would I need to have in place to make certain that I don't move over into what could possibly be a political position that, as this student said, allows you not to get real? about the issues, what are the dynamics that would need to be in place to ensure we build a town that grows children into adults? Well, I think that it really is about your vision, about what it is you want to see. And if you believe deeply in trying to build a place that's fit for children, then you've got to lay that vision out and you've got to hang on to that. And secondly, you've got to see your role as serving that vision. I am tired of leaders who think that they are the end rather than the means. Yes. We are instruments of service. You know, congregations are instruments of service. Those of us who are faith are instruments to be used. And so just constantly ask whether the children are going to be gaining or losing by these decisions. If every political leader asked when they voted whether an eight-year-old, they're looking over their shoulder, would be better off or worse off by that decision, or if every private sector person in their policies really asks whether they're making it easier or harder for parents to do their job. And you know, and if public people running health departments and schools said, my goodness, if I hold a teacher conference at 12 o'clock, is that, or, or 2 o'clock, is that going to be easier or harder for a parent who's working? What makes it so that public health clinics aren't open on Saturday mornings and after 5 o'clock if we know that parents are working? So asking the right questions all the time and saying, is it good for children, not teachers, not, you know, the business community, not I mean, really constantly trying to keep yourself grounded in the vision of building community. For children, it's hard. They're all, decisions are never easy. It's sometimes 55, 45, but you need to keep asking the right questions to hold yourself accountable. Thank Glad you. you're trying to do that. Thank you. Last question, because I'm Elman? tired of hearing my voice, Mrs. too. Elman? Right up there. Yes. Right. Yes, my name is Joyce Bradshaw. Hi, Joyce. Hi. Um, I thank God for you today. I came here by accident. And as you can see, I have practically the same colors as you do. But I am a cleaning woman. That's all I do for a living. 
Um, you are right when you say it's because of the adults that our children are, our children are suffering. I am a mother of three and a grandmother of five. I gave my daughter up when she was three years old, and we found each other in 96. So I'm trying to help her, and I'm trying to help my grandchildren to grow up better than I did. Um, I was an alcoholic. I got my information from June Hunt, which helped me stop drinking. I'm asking you, my question is, I can't afford it, but I want to continue to come to this seminar. If there's somebody that doesn't want to come, could you arrange for me I to come? I think you're in. <laughs> I, think I have you're more in. to say, but that's all I can say right now. But God bless you. You all need to go to church. That's how God helped me, and that's the gospel tru truth. I go to Shiloh Baptist. Which in, city? In West Medford. Dr. Welvin E. Smith. Well, you have to. He's clean in house, but he's doing a good job. <laughs> and on that, amen, and thank you. Can I just say one last thing? Well, since we're all talking about the serendipity of the Reds, I have to, obviously I grew up at the Shallow Baptist Church in Bennettsville, and my church in Washington is the Shallow Baptist Church, so I'm always happy to see another shallow person. We must never lose hope. We have got to begin to gain more strength from each other. There is no greater calling than trying to see whether our nation, that in many ways changed because of the moral witness of school children and the extraordinary witness of ordinary people, ordinary women and men and children who brought about the impossible end of apartheid in America, and we saw what happened in South Africa, we have got to be clear that we can build a new world and a new nation that has different values and that we can together build that over time. And I just want to just end with, you know, it's overwhelming, but we just got to believe that we can do it. That's what, that's what starts it. We've got to come with a different moral vision that is grounded in our faith. Um, and in our concern for each other. You know, the more we become depersonalized and the more we see things getting bigger, the more we need to cling and build community and reweave our families and build the bridges between ourselves across age and class. But I often get overwhelmed too. Um, and I always think again about Sojourner and the Fleet story, which I tell a lot because it is a part of my vision. We know, I at least know what I would like to see America be in the new century. I know what it would mean to leave no child behind and what we could provide our children a new hope. I think we know how to, some of the things that work and how to move the scale. What we know we need is political will and what we need is to give everybody a bite that they can manage. Some of us can do big things, but I really did love Sojourner's answer to that heckler when he told her he didn't care anymore about her old anti-slavery talk and clearly it was unthinkable that slavery could end. Um, or about equality for women, and clearly that was something that was impossible to change, and she snapped back at him and said, that's all right. The Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. Enough fleas biting strategically <laughs> can make the biggest dog uncomfortable. I have seen the flea core for children. It was very lonely 25 years ago and 30 years ago, but I have seen the flea corps for children grow and grow and grow. You know, I mean, four months we got 200,000 people to come to stand for children in Washington without celebrities, without a whole lot of notice. You know, and in 1997 we went on back and stood locally and that got us $48 billion with Mr. Hatch and Mr. Kennedy and I watched the little fleet corps learn how to do local mobilizations and, and now they're going on off the school board meetings and I'm seeing all kinds of changes. We must believe it and we must build together that massive flea core that bites and bites. And I hope when you get next year, our election year pledge of commitments in the last election year of the 20th century, I think it's not too much to ask of our political leaders to make a commitment for health care for every American, 
for poverty, for all the working folks and children. We can end that in this country for a little bit of what we're putting into the defense budget. We can talk about transferring money from corporate welfare to child welfare. We want to lay out a very specific agenda, and I hope that you will get those commitments. And then I hope in 2001, we will come back together in the most massive flea corps that ever was <laughs> to hold them accountable for the results. I, now it's more important. There are no friends in politics without outside constituents. And the movement has to be built if we're going to transform this country. So I think I'm more useful on the outside. But thank you for your interest and have a great meeting. Thank you all for being here. The participants for Core Connections will be going over to the Fogg Museum and their volunteers with yellow signs to lead the way. Any students who would like to be more involved in the panels and discussions coming up, would you come up here to the stage if you have not already signed up? And we're happy to tell you how you can plug in. Thank you.